Good morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, hope you're fine. And uh, I wish you had happy holidays. And for all our uh, Muslim brothers, happy Ramadan. Uh, actually, today I'm uh, very happy to be joining with you in Indo Coffee from uh, Indo Star Pool Dent. I'm happy also to join the motion of uh, stay home and stay safe. And um, actually, today we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of uh, the heat-treated files and uh, some of the clinical applications of these files uh, to our clinical practice in endodontics and how did, uh, these files contribute to increase the success and the safety of our uh, practice. So, uh, without further delay, I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, First of all, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is uh, Professor, Associate Professor Mohammed Qataya. I'm an Associate Professor of Endodontics at the British University in Egypt. And uh, I've been practicing endodontics since 2004. And uh, I'd like to give a little bit of an introduction. Actually, um, what's our mission in root canal treatment? Our mission in root canal treatment is to safely maneuver every canal complexity and to produce an error-free cleaning and shaping. And to do error-free shaping and cleaning, we must have knowledge and some of the technology. The destination uh, of our journey is the apical foramen. So um, how are you going to do that and how are you going to use our technology uh, for that. First of all, uh, we have to know that shaping with engine-driven instruments can be categorized into two uh, principal steps. This is my personal point of view and it's not uh, a Bible or a Quran. No, it's, it's just my practice and I'd like to say that uh, we have to prepare the canal first before we enlarge it with engine-driven instruments. So, canal preparation is mainly patency and then glide path. You should go through these two steps before enlarging your canal with any engine driven instrument. And most of my practice I take around um, uh, 85. Okay, if there is a problem and we can't see the presentation, I'm really sorry for that. I'm gonna start all over again. No, actually I changed into scene three. Okay, I'm going to start all over again, there is no problem, some technical errors have happened, it's normal, so I hope now you can see the presentation, if so, please give me a check. Okay, so I'm going to start again with my first slide. This was my first slide, and I was talking about uh, our mission in root canal treatment, especially uh, general practitioners or uh, recent endodontists. Um, my lecture today is a little bit basic, not as my colleagues earlier with uh, Indo Coffee. So our mission is to safely maneuver every canal complexity and to provide an error-free shaping and cleaning. And to do that, you have to have both knowledge and technology. And this is what we are going to talk about today. What does technology provide for us? So, again, what I was saying is, engine-driven experience in root canal treatment, in my point of view, should be categorized into canal preparation and then you can go for canal enlargement. Canal preparation is mainly two steps, which is the patency to reach your full working length safely, 
and to ensure that your apical foramen is patent and not obstructed. Step number two is the glide path and this is provision of a smooth surface in order that the engine driven instruments can glide or slide safely to the full working length. So what I was saying is in my practice I take 85% of my time in this step and only 15% of my time in the canal enlargement because if you do both of these steps safely canal enlargement won't be a problem provided that you are using the recent technology which is mainly the heat treated wires so in short what is a patency and glide path first of all of course patency is uh, the safe passage of the first file from portal of entry which is the orifice till portal of exit which is the apical foramen you should ensure that your apical foramen is patent by passing with a half a millimeter through it to ensure that it's not obstructed while glide path has a different motion the glide path motion is a push-pull motion in the glide path we should provide that we have a smooth wall so that the enlarging instruments coming after the glide path file will glide safely and not form any internal transportation and their tips won't be faced with any resistance so provision of a smooth surface with a manual file is mandatory before using any enlarging instrument in complexity or in canal complexities these two steps might be a little bit difficult and the glide path and insurance of presence of glide path uh, is a little bit difficult because as we all know that stainless steel file are not as flexible as nickel titanium and uh, here we have to use manual file first so what I say is we can go through size 10 to provide a glide path in a push-pull motion as you can see here but in severe complexity and in severe curvatures we do not go with size 15 immediately I know you can do it with a new size 15 but in stainless steel file size 15 is a little bit stiff especially if you're working in a dial laceration or if you're working in a severely curved canal transition from size 10 to size 15 immediately is a little bit dangerous and you might find that size 15 even if it did not break it will introduce you to internal canal transportation what I say is if we have an intermediate size between size 15 and size 10 this would be an advantage for us in complicated canals and in curvatures so if you have a dial laceration or a hook shaped curvature or a severe curvature or even a double curvature please do not move from 10 to 15 immediately please try to use size 12.5 because there is a 50 percent increase in size between 15 and 10 and this is an increased transition size what i'm saying here is if we have a solution which is the 12.5 why not use it so in severe complexities I use 10 first in a glide path motion push pull then I go for 12.5 which is the file in the photo and the video in front of you and instead of going for a stainless steel size 15 I use my night i2 which are glide path files made specifically to this step night i2 are s-shaped cross-section files and they have a very minimal taper which is taper 2 so s-shaped with taper 2 makes them extremely flexible and they have very little mass so their restoring forces won't be tough they will never stra uh, straighten your canal so what I recommend as a recipe for uh, complex canals or complex anatomies is to go manual files size 10 12.5 and then move to rotary nickel titanium glide path files size 15 then 20 in this scenario you'll never cause any internal transportation because you've worked with number one manual files to provide a smooth wall for a glide path rotary file 
So you made a microglide path first, and then you moved into the macroglide path. This makes it easier for the enlargement step to be provided, because if you reach file size 20 in the glide path motion, so any previous or any files that will come afterwards, they will have a smooth glide they can run through to the epical foramen. And providing that you gave the canal a size 20, which is of the glide path file number 2, night I2 number 2, this will make all enlarging files have decreased stress on their tips. So they will safely drive you to the epical foramen without any torsion. So, again, we were talking about categorizing the engine-driven experience into first canal preparation and then we'll go to canal enlargement. So in canal enlargement, there are multiple factors to put in mind, but to talk about each factor alone will take a very long time. So specifically today, I'd like to talk about the tool and I'll mention other factors in the middle of my presentation. In our coffee meeting today, we're going to talk about the benefits of heat treated wires in both axis cavity and radicular cavity preparations. How did the heat treated wire affect our axis cavity and radicular cavity preparations? Of course, since 2012, we have been talking about the biominimalistic trends in endodontics. Biominimalistic in terms of trying to save as much as possible of the biologic tooth structure and trying to decrease as much as possible of the restorative material. Because as a fact, we know that there is no restorative material that can replace any mechanical characteristics of the lost dentine. So in short, you have to try and save as much as possible of tooth structure and you have to go for conservative cavity designs because any tooth structure that you can save will definitely affect the survival of the tooth in a long-term manner. And there is a big difference between the success that you target today in endodontics and the survival that you will need to target in the coming years of this patient's life. You need to target survival to ensure that the patient can use this tooth for as long as possible. How do we do this? By conserving as much as possible of root canal dentine. It's very simple. Try not to remove a lot of biologic tissue. This is why a lot of studies have been done on the contracted endodontic axes and they found that contracted endodontic axis cavities have significantly improved the fatigue resistance of the tooth. It decreases the fracture. This is the demo for the contracted endodontic axis and a comparison between the shape and the size between it and the traditional endodontic axis. Traditional endodontic axis provided a principle that we should have a straight line from our cavity to the orifice. In contracted axis, we don't have to open and flare all the walls and remove all this dentine and enamel. Leaving the soffits above the uh, pulp horns will definitely increase the fatigue resistance of this tooth. Another design for the axis cavity also described in the literature was the truss axis or the dentine directed conservation axis. It provides that in lower molars when we open the axis cavity we leave a truss of dentine and enamel between the buccal and lingual wall. The target of the truss axis is mainly to decrease the cuspal flexion. We do not want any cuspal flexion between the lingual and the buccal wall. So leaving a truss of dentine in between them will definitely provide us with decreased flexion. This study was done in uh, Al Azhar University here in Egypt, where I work, and it was published in the Journal of Endodontics in 2019. And they found that there was significant increase in the fracture resistance when we do a truss axis. 
So, does any case work with uh, conservatism? No, we have rules for conservatism. First of all, you must work with magnification. You have to have magnification in order to try to explore aureole anatomy. Also, cone beam computed tomography as a blueprint is very important. You should be provided in contracted endodontic axes with a cone beam blueprint before you start working. Why? As we know, Baruti et al. in 2009 said that we have reliability with the CBCT to detect any missed anatomy. So if I'm going for a contracted axis, which will limit definitely my vision, I'd like to go with a CBCT blueprint before I start working. Also, bear in mind that your pulp chamber will be difficult to reach here and in the soffits below the pulp horns. So we have to use activated irrigation to agitate our sodium hypochlorite inside the cavity and inside the root canal. This agitation will help dissolve as much as possible of tissue. Last but not least are what we are going to talk about today, the heat treated wires. Of course, entering an access cavity in a, a different situation rather than the occlusal surface, we will need a file that will have less uh, restoring forces. And this will only happen with the heat treated wires. So, again, first of all, to remind you, now we are talking about the use of heat treated wires in our access cavity preparation. Later on, we're going to talk about the heat treated wires and how they affect our radicular cavity preparation. And for the access cavity preparation, as I said, we can go for a conservative approach, like in this case, for example, this is a lower premolar with a caries directed cavity, which means that we went through the caries in the buccal surface. As you can see here, I can bend my heat treated wire and direct it into the canal and then start my preparation. Why? Did I do this? Because a heat treated wire can be easily pre-bent and this will help me direct it to enter into the canal and prepare it. And of course, as I said, one of the rules of uh, contracted cavities is the agitation and uh, uh, the activation of our ergens. So as you can see here, we did not enter through the occlusal cavity and after obturation, you can find that all our lateral canals are filled properly and there are no problems with the root canal treatment in the radicular area because of the constricted access cavity. Another form of access cavity in a clinical situation is a truss access. So, in this video, you're going to see a truss access prepared and a caries directed access in the mesial wall. So, here I entered through the mesial wall, I removed all my caries to enter to the mesial canals and I opened a small opening above the distal canal, leaving a truss between the buccal and the lingual wall. This truss left between the buccal and the lingual wall will definitely decrease future flexion between the two walls and this will ensure increased survival rates of this tooth and it will also ensure that the patient can eat properly and with decreased flexion. So, without the heat treated wires, I cannot pre bend these files and enter into each canal to prepare it. Also, without a comb beam computed tomography, I'll never have the ability to ensure that I have reached all my canals and prepared them. You have to take a comb beam computed tomography and you have to have a heat treated wire. Here, I was ensuring that there was no middle mesial canal and I even kept looking and I troughed the isthmus a lot in between the mesial and the mesial lingual. As you can see, another requirement for contracted cavities is to have a magnification. And when you have a magnification, you can also ensure that you have uh, all your canals and you can inspect it properly. Also, you can ensure that you have the brided the chamber properly and uh, inspect all the floor to see that you do not need to agitate your irrigation anymore. By the end of my preparation, 
everything was proper. Here, the distal canal had a single orifice, but it has uh, it had two uh, canals. So uh, if I didn't have the comb beam, I would have never looked for the extra canal. So how did the heat treated wire benefit me in the contracted axis? Number one, I used my tactile controlled activation technique, which promotes that we can pre-curve a file and point it into the orifice of my canal before its activation, before its rotation. So after we tuck it properly in the canal and pack it, now we can activate the file. This technique or this approach is called tactile controlled activation approach. Okay, so why is this technique very useful? Because in situations like a buckle approach from class 5 and lower premolars, if you have a straight file that you cannot bend, you'll have to open in the occlusal surface to provide the straight file with a straight access to your canal. But with a heat treated wire, you can point it even if you don't have a straight access to your canal. And this is very important because this will mean that you will not need to open another occlusal cavity and you will not produce a defect in this tooth. In addition, another advantage of the heat treated wire is that this file can be easily pre-bent and sustain its bending property. So this means that the metal has less restoring forces. It does not want to go back to its original shape as much as the normal M wire files. So, in this case, when we are working with an extreme curvature point of entry from our access cavity, we will not produce additional transportation inside our canals because our file has less restoring forces. Moving over to our radicular cavity complexities. How will our heat treated wires affect our experience in difficult situations? If you have an apical hook shaped or a dilaceration like shown in my x-rays here, it's very important that you should think of working with a heat treated wire. Of course, as we all know, what is more important than working with a heat treated wire is to first apply the proper canal preparation steps for a safe engine driven experience which means that you should ensure your patency first and then go with the glide path recipe that I've mentioned earlier which is a very very smooth up push pull motion with size 10 then you should choose an intermediate size which is 12.5 and then you should discard your stainless steel hand instruments and go with a very thin mass of rotary nickel titanium files with a very small taper. This will ensure higher flexibility and decreased restoring forces. So, like in these cases, there is minimal or 0% transportation, although the difficulty of our curvatures is apparent. So, in severe curvatures, how can we provide nearly zero transportation inside our canals. First of all, we're going to use our activation method, which is the tactile controlled activation, as I've explained earlier. Second of all, of course, is to treat the canal as it has separate zones. We should go for a crown down approach, as uh, stated in the literature, that crown down approach has the least stress on the canal walls and the files. Of course, we should work with a heat treated wire to be able to do a tactile control activation technique. And also, we need a heat treated wire that has less restoring forces, which will cause decreased transportation. Our curvature will not straighten. Last but not least, the OTR motion, which I will explain in the next slide. As we can see in this x-ray here, the distal buckle canal has a weird shape. It has a buckle curvature. I want you to concentrate on this area here. And then after I remove this figure, look at the x-ray closely. 
you'll find that the distobacca canal is as if it's looking at you. And you'll see that the gutperca is in the exact center of the root. This is called bull's eye effect. This means that this canal has nearly a 0% transportation because we have worked with tactile controlled activation in a crown down approach with a heat treated wire and the motor adjusted on an optimum torque reduction motion. So what's the optimum torque reduction or the OTR which was introduced by Morita in December of 2018? It's a continuous rotation motion that when faced with increased resistance it will change its continuous rotation motion as we can see in the video here into cutting reciprocation alternate rotation motion so how will this benefit me when the file is faced with increased uh, resistance inside our canal the file is faced with a lot of torsion so instead of cutting with increased stress and torsion the file will change from a continuous rotation form to a cutting reciprocation form. And this is extremely difficult from a uh, safe stop and reversing and getting out of the canal. This does not mean that the file has a safe stop. No, this means that the file will continue cutting, but in a manner that will decrease the torsion on this file. So now you have nearly no fear from torsional failure your file will never break from torsional failure because you're working with optimum torque reduction. As soon as the torque in your motor starts increasing, the motor will not wait until the torque reaches the maximum that the file can handle. It will immediately change into cutting reciprocation or alternate rotation. And of course, the angles of the alternate rotation is provided with each system that can work with the OTR. Okay, so if you have a split, for example, in earlier years of root canal treatment, we used to extremely enlarge our coronal portion in order for our rotary straight files to enter in each canal separately. But if you have a heat treated wire, that can prevent and directed with tactile control activation into each split now you have no need to increase the width of your coronal portion before the split this is very important because conservatism or biominimalism is not only in the axis cavity but it's also present in the radicular portion as much as you can save from the radicular dentine will definitely increase the survival rate of this tooth. So if I have splits and I want to work with an engine driven file and I want to conserve my coronal portion above this split, I'll need a file that can pre-bent and direct it into the direction of the split. You can pre-bent it buckly and enter in the buckle split first, finish its preparation after you finish using also tactile control activation, which means that you can prevent the file and put it while it's inactive. And then after you enter the canal, you can start activating it. So once you finished with the buckle, retrieve your file, clean it, irrigate, then prevent your file and enter into the lingual canal. This will ensure that uh, uh, you can prepare your canals, both of your canals, and uh, be safe. Yeah. What about double curvatures and ledge bypass? So, also in double curvatures and ledge bypasses, tactile controlled activation is needed. And I'll tell you why. Also in double curvatures, your files are subjected to extreme torsion, extreme torsion and cyclic fatigue. So the kinematic of choice or the cutting motion of choice will definitely be the OTR. And to prevent fracture, you must use a very strong file. 
file that has nearly 80% increase in cyclic fatigue resistance due to the heat treatment. So heat treated files are definitely higher in cyclic fatigue resistance and higher in resistance to separation or fracture than normal files. So if you're planning to prepare a canal with a severe difficulty like dilacerations or double curvatures, you definitely need to choose a heat treated wire. In a case of the upper center that you saw earlier in the previous slide, this one here, this is an upper center incisor with a bayonet root. My friend sent me this case and he told me that he couldn't enter within a three millimeter from the canal. After I took a comb beam computed tomography, I found that the bayonet shape was not mesiodistal, it was in a buccal lingual direction. Because my digital x-ray first showed that it was in a mesiodistal direction, but this was the simple curve. The difficult curve after the CBCT was in a buccal lingual or a labial lingual direction. So here, when he entered with a normal M wire file, because he thought the curvature was easy, because he did not take a CBCT prior entering to this tooth, he produced a ledge like this. A ledge is an internal transportation of the canal off its original path. Instead of gliding to the original path of the canal, a severe ledge was formed after three millimeters in the canal. So, by using a heat treated wire, in the case of this ledge, it was very simple to bypass the ledge and prepare the remaining of the curvatures. By pre curving or pre bending my file and introducing it beyond the ledge first before its activation. After I pass the ledge using a previously curved file, now I can activate it with my motor and I can prepare the canal beyond my ledge. In this video, you'll see that we have an extreme ledge in our distal uh, root canals. And of course, uh, prior to heat treated wires, we never uh, were able to use uh, heat, um, rotary nickel titanium files in uh, ledges. We used only manual stainless steel. In order to bypass the ledge easy and prepare it. And of course, the preparation took a very long time. So, after you bypass the ledge and take your working length with a hand file, after you remove your medication, you can use a pre-curved rotary file in tactile controlled activation. As you can see here, I bypassed the ledge first, and then I started activating my file. It's very important to use this technique because um, if you don't enter with the file in an inactive manner, you won't be able to point the file and direct it to the place where it can go beyond the ledge. So, in ledges and internal transportations, tactile controlled activation, which can only be done with control memory or heat treated wires, is very important. Moving forward, what if you have an extra anatomy that will definitely cause the canal to be narrow or in some particular cases extremely calcified. What are the requirements of your tool here? You require a tool that can work with decreased tension. We need something that will provide us with nearly a 0% torsional failure. Why? Because we know that narrow calcified canals have increased torsion rate on our files. So my motion of choice in extra anatomies and in narrow calcified canals would definitely be the optimum torque reduction. In addition, I need a strong file that I can work with and that has increased cyclic fatigue resistance than normal files. So here I'll go to the Azure Heat treated files. Also, in molars that have five root canals, when you have a mesobuccal one and a mesobuccal two, as in this picture here, 
Definitely you've noticed if you're working Indu for a little while that presence of two Mizibaka canals will definitely cause an extremely narrow canal and it will make the MB1 extremely narrow, MB2 extremely narrow. What about if you have two distobaka canals in the same tooth? You'll find through experience that as canals increase in a single root, that these canals will definitely be much more narrower than if it had only one canal. So here we need to work with the optimum torque reduction protocol and we need to use a very strong file. And this is not only in three rooted premolars or five root canal molars, it's also in lower molars. Lower molars also can experience a lot of middle mesial canals like in this case or in this scenario and most of our middle mesial canals usually confluent or co-join before the apical foramen. But if you have a completely separate canal from orifice till apical foramen, this means that all three canals in one root will definitely be extremely narrow. And in extremely narrow canals, you need to work with the OTR motion, kinematic, and a strong file, which in this scenario should be a heat-treated wire. Why should it be a heat-treated wire, not a control memory wire? Because heat-treated Azure files, actually, as my colleagues previously mentioned in the earlier endodontic coffee meetings, if you uh, were following, they said that this file has a martensetic character outside the body temperature. And as soon as it enters the canal, it has the austenetic characters, which provides this file with a very high cutting efficiency during its cutting inside the canal. So, in narrow canals, not only will you decrease the torsion on the file by using the OTR motion, you will also decrease the torsion by decreasing the wear and friction. Why? because you have a high cutting efficiency file. And this is a property in the Azure because the difference between the transform transformation from martensetic to austenetic is a very small range. If you look at the curvature in the manuscript of this file, you'll find that the R phase has a very small part. The file will immediately transfer to an austenetic file which has an extremely high cutting efficiency. So, in narrow canals, not only will you be saving yourself with the OTR motion, but also you will be working with a file that as soon as it enters the body temperature will have an extremely high cutting efficiency. Not in the case of the control memory wire, which is a blunt file and does not have cutting efficiency. I know it's very difficult to break it, but it will be under extreme torsion. So my choice will definitely be the heat treated wires. I know I've been talking for a long time. I'm ending my presentation with this case demonstration, an extremely calcified premolar. Even the pulp chamber is not present. I had to trough for a very long time to find my canals with the ultrasonics and the palatal canal took even longer time so you can imagine how did the canals feel. I had extremely calcified canals and this is why I had to use my heat treated wires. I'd like to always open my orifice before taking the working length with the apex locator. So I use the orifice opener from the Azure E3. Then I take my working length. This means that I'll prepare this canal in a crown down fashion. So I go with file number two, pre-curve, enter inside the canal and then start operating for the middle third. Then the E3 finisher file, which is the last file, I'll pre-curve it, also enter with a tactile control activation and start my activation inside the canal. This gave me a very rapid uh, preparation and my agitation used the ultrasonic sonic files also from Poland 
to activate my irrigation properly before I obturate, then I go for dryness and then I obturate. I'm really sorry for the long time for my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for being present and I don't want you to forget our next Indo Coffee meeting with Dr. Vatkar. It's a very nice presentation. You're gonna enjoy it and it will definitely add for your experience. Thank you very much for uh, your time and thank you for your uh, audience. Now I'll be answering some of the questions uh, that you have answered during my presentation. So I'd like to start by turning into the phase view. Here we are. Good morning. Okay, so to start with the questions that you've sent during my presentation, of course, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you again in person for being with me during the presentation. Uh, I'll start with the first question. So, do we have a bigger risk of twisting the tip of the file using the tire controlled activation? Okay, so, of course, we don't have a, a bigger risk. You know why? Because if we were using uh, a normal M wire file or a 19 old file, first of all, you can bend it using a cryotherapy by putting a cooling agent on the file, even if you have an M wire file, and you can bend it. But it's not as strong and it cannot withstand the stress that will be put on the file when you enter and tuck it in the canal and then start activating. Because of the heat treatment, this file is extremely strong and it can withstand the forces that will be subjected on the file. Not only this, uh, Azure heat treated files are characterized by having an S-shaped cross section like the Reciproc or like other files with S-shaped cross section. They have very high cutting efficiency. So when they start rotating, they will remove any obstruction in the canal. As I said earlier, they will change into austenetic uh, character when they enter inside the canal. So this will increase also the cutting efficiency of the heat treated file. So there is no risk actually. The technique of the tactile controlled activation was described first for the control memory files and then to the heat treated files. So no risk, don't worry. It's an advantage, not a risk because uh, when you work with a tactile controlled activation, you will definitely have the shape of the curve before you start rotating. This means when the file is inactive and has the same shape of the curve, and then it starts rotating, it will cut from the upper wall as same as the lower wall. So now you will ensure that you don't have transportation. The file does not want to restore. It will rotate with the shape of the curve. This means that you will decrease your transportation. So the tactile controlled activation, it's not a risk. Now, the second question, is the tactile controlled activation better than the crown down technique? Okay, there's a big difference between activation method and uh, the crown down technique. I'll move to Scene three for one second, because I'd like to share with you my first slide. Okay, so to answer your question, here you can see in the presentation, I have an approach and I have engine activation. My approach will be crown down technique. This is the approach that you take to prepare your canal. But your activation method, whether it's activation outside of the canal or activation inside of the canal, is totally different thing. I can work with a crown down approach and use a tactile control activation method. So the approach you take, either step back, crown down, or hybrid technique. In all these approaches, you can work with the tactile controlled activation. Because tactile controlled activation only dictates that 
you start activation your engine when the file is tucked inside the canal okay so this is the second question and now I'll go back to scene number two and here we go okay so to continue answering the questions in tactile control activation technique we can use only rotary files or also we can use reciprocation files okay so actually this technique is described for the rotating files continuous rotating files because you know that when you're working with reciprocation files you are already in a decreased risk for fracture because the reciprocation files were introduced to the market to decrease the cyclic fatigue failure of the file instead of the file continually rotating in a curvature it will rotate and release rotate and release rotate and release so this decreases the number of cycles that the file takes in a curvature which will definitely delay its fracture so if you're already working with a reciprocating file you are in no need of the OTR motion the OTR motion optimum torque reduction is mainly described for the continuous rotating files okay so to continue answering your question if the continuous rotating files if the reciprocating files I'm sorry are already safe so why do I use a continuous rotating file and uh, why do I need the OTR motion it's simple because there was a huge uh, debate in literature between in literature sorry between the effect of uh, the rotating and reciprocating files in uh, apical extrusion of debris and a lot of people have uh, the concept that reciprocating files introduce more apical debris beyond the apex than rotation because when rotating motion is happening the debris are directed directly to the coronal portion so this decreases the uh, apical extrusion of debris what I like to do is to work in a continuous rotation motion using the OTR technique in this case I'll uh, introduce my debris coronally out of the orifice and at the same time be safe while rotating in uh, an increased curvature I will change to the OTR now I'll continue uh, answering the questions <clears throat> have you considered night I2 from Indostar for glide path actually I don't know if you were listening to the presentation I said that I'm using night I2 for the glide path but after I use the number 10 manual and 12.5 I have to prepare the file with manual files before I enter with the rotary even if it is a rotary glide path file I have to use a manual file first because if you don't use a manual file if you don't use your tactile sensation to feel your canal you should not go for rotary files even if they are glide path files in my opinion glide path files are for the second phase of the glide path the glide path should be described as micro which is manual files number 10 and number 12.5 not number 15 12.5 has a smooth transition from number 10 this is micro then phase number two you should expand your glide path before the enlarging engine driven instrument expanding the glide path will ensure safe of work enlarging the glide path could be done with a rotary nickel titanium glide path file like the night i2 that i prefer to use as i said in my presentation it has an advantage of a decreased taper and a very thin mass so it gives it increased flexibility in addition it has an s-shaped cross-section 
which gives it a very high cutting efficiency. Okay, so that is the question for the night eye too. And of course, I use it in my practice. What is your cleaning protocol in the straight canal and curved canal or obliterated canal? Okay, my cleaning protocol is as follows. For the straight canals, there is no problem. I use the uh, Indusar E5 system, which is the earlier version of the heat-treated files. Uh, or I use the E3 because I'm not afraid that the file will fracture because it's a straight canal. And how do I know that I finished my cleaning? It's very simple according to Plutino, Professor Plutino. In his research, he said that we can do what is called uh, visual gouging. What's visual gouging? If you find on your finishing file white, clean, dentine chips, and you can reach with your arrogant to the apical third, your sodium hypochlorite can be activated at the apical third. This means that you do not need to enlarge. So my approach in straight canals is very simple. I go for a crown down technique also. And I stop my preparation when I find that my file is loaded with white clean dentine chips and my irrigant can reach to the apical third and my activation method can reach to the same area. Regarding obliterated canals, okay, regarding obliterated canals or uh, um, difficult curvatures, I mentioned that you have four fundamentals. In obliterated and difficult curvature, I work with crown down approach. Coronal, middle, apical. I work with the OTR motion. I have to work with the OTR motion because it's an extreme curvature or an extreme calcification. So the OTR is the safest because the file will never fracture. It will change from rotation to reciprocation and if the torque increases to the maximum, it will reverse and go up. So it's very safe. I work with tactile controlled activation. Yeah, my activation method is tactile controlled activation. And this is to provide that the file has the same shape of the curvature before it starts cutting. This will decrease the transportation because the file will cut from the lower wall as same as the upper wall and there will no be restoring forces. There will not be restoring forces. Uh, this is my approach for 